sugar and space and all things nice. All this and more coming up on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Pour some sugar on me. Copyright or copy wrong. And the second best space sim ever. All this and more coming up on this week's show. Up to date news for out of date tech. Welcome back, Dave. Did you enjoy your week off? I certainly did. Yeah. Although I didn't enjoy the comments because not one single person said they missed me. Oh, poor Dave. Poor Dave. And you're such a sensitive fellow, aren't you? I know you need those comments. So should I should I just stop doing this and just Oh, Go come away. on. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to harvest sympathy now, are you? <laughs> I um, think we... people were just delighted to see Chris. <laughs> they were. Everyone likes they Chris. Were. <laughs> and if you missed it on a, a few shows back when Chris was on, uh, he has kindly agreed to come on probably once a month, maybe uh, once every six months, um, maybe every second Tuesday of every Monday, Dave. Yeah, yeah. The first Monday of every Thursday. Yeah, so he'll be he'll be back on. Um, but it's Dave and I uh, again this week. How are we doing for guests, Dave? Have we got any booked for the Any there? guests at all. I've got a few ideas for guests that I will book. Um, anyone that shows any interest in the show that I think would be good on it will get booked. Um, I try to book people who have at least shown that they've watched the show before. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I've, I will book some guests soon. And um, I think... We're not going to announce anything yet, but we are working on a live show at the cave. So yeah. as soon as we've got a date, we'll announce that. Um, hopefully, sort of just maybe just after Christmas or January for, for something for us and hopefully other people to look forward to coming yeah. to uh, post Christmas in that lull after Christmas. Yeah, that miserable period of the year where the, the weather is bad, the nights are dark, and there's plenty of time for retro computing. Exactly. News my my end this week, um, as I've come back to uh, the cave and I've got back into the process of video making, and thank you everyone for the the positive feedback that I've had on that, because I've had a really nice response uh, to the the content and the quality of the videos I've been making, and that has been... Um, in large part possible made possible thanks to Dan coming on board and helping me to run the museum. He's doing a great job. Thank you, Dan. Um, Holly's help, as always, the omnipresent Holly supporting everything. Um, and also, uh, well, that just given me the time to make the videos. And then more recently, uh, Richard's been helping with a video from Heber. And I was mulling over things a lot when I was off as to how do you balance family life you know, you all heard me on this show saying, I've just done another seven day week. I've just worked every hour possible. It's not, it's not possible with a family, right? It's not possible. And also to keep the quality of content up, it's not possible. I can't burn myself out. So anyway, the long and the short of it is I've hatched a plan, run it by the others. And we've all agreed that the retro collective, that's the arcade archive, myself and Heber are going to work much more closely together. We're going to bring our content making skills together. I will still be the front of it very much. Um, I will still be editing. But Richard and Holly and Dan and anyone else uh, in the mill is going to be helping to feed that content into me so that we can share more skills, make more interesting videos, and have one point of output. Now, how that's all going to work, I'll be announcing um, over the coming months. Uh, patrons will know all about it by the time this show comes out. Um, but all you need to know for now is there's going to be more, better, more detailed, more exciting content from all of us uh, on the channel so looking forward to that and do you know what this week in retro is part of the retro collective right you guys are you're part of the whole thing as are well we? are we are we yeah. am i being i'm being I, I bogged up now I yes we are so. it, it feels very much like it yeah it feels yeah. very much like it so anything we update i think we need to include this week in. i mean i've already got you on my youtube page on the front for other people to click on and find us i say you us me all of us um so, yeah, the collective is coming together in, I think, a very natural way, in, in the way that when I tell people, they go, well, yeah, duh, obviously, why haven't you done that before? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've always thought it needs to be sustainable and healthy for you. Otherwise, you'll just burn out and you'll reach a point where people are watching videos thinking, he's been doing this too long and he's, his heart's not in it. And um, yeah. you need to make sure that you don't end up in that position. Yeah, And it's fun working with other people. 
I mean, really enjoy making videos with other people, especially people like Richard and Holly with such, yeah. you know, such a skill set. So that's great. You know, I'm talking to you right now. Richard is, um, this won't be public yet. Richard is burning some roms for me to demonstrate something oh, very yes. special. Yes, I know what it is. I know yeah. what it is. Very special with the uh, yeah. Arcadia system. Um, so yeah, lots going on. Anyway, enough about me. Tell me about your woes, Dave. I'm fine. I have no woes at all. I was at um, Terrible Bites. Uh, people have seen that if they watched Lee's More Fun Making It um, event stream that the, 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 the raised so much money for charity with the donkey mugs and all the rest of it. I had a fantastic time at Terrible Bites, which is just it's a, a private party run by Terrible Fire in his... Um, um, in Glasgow, uh, it's, it's a private. It's a private party, but I've seen far too many photos leaked from that private party. Oh, it's not a case you can't <laughs> leak for. You can, you can you can share photos. You wouldn't you wouldn't give a photo of someone looking bad though. But yeah, there's there's there was plenty going on. It's not a secret thing. It's no. just an invite only. Um, lots of people. The Hoffman was there. Banjo Guy Ollie was there. Ravi was there. Ravi was Abbott was there. Loads of people. If I start naming them all, I'll leave someone out and they'll feel bad. So loads of people were there. Fantastic time. Uh, I was absolutely shattered after it. And then on the Monday, I had all the CRTs to move so that I can get the loft done. So that's moving on. Things will. I, I'm going to extend through that. You can see that glass door there, Neil? Yeah, I see that glass door. Through there is half the garage, which is my workshop. I'm going to take the workshop out, convert the, the rest of the garage, and that's going to be where the pinball goes and where I put uh, my CRT modern gaming thing. I'll probably put a BBC Micro there as well. I might even get arcade cabs. So it's finally starting to happen. Fantastic. Um, Who but, needs a car? Well, the car's too big for the garage. It's, it's, it's the a way, 1960s it? garage, so you need to put like one of those little Reliant Robins in. Yeah, an Austin Maestri. I think the car might go in, but the doors wouldn't open. Yeah, same problem here. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Garages are just ridiculous. Or cars are. Or cars are, yeah. Right, well, that's all great to hear. Um, I, I hope to make it to Terrible Bites next year, which is exactly what I said this time last year. Stephen is insistent that you go next year. He really I wants know. you to go to the point of, how can we How can we make sure Neil goes? So stick it in your diary. I will. Book the, book the hotel. I'll do my very best. Should we get into the stories today? Yes. Let's do it. In 1984, a new product launched. One that would change the lives of not just Neil and I, but even producer Duncan. It's a product that all three of us loved, and we still do. The Amstrad CPC was Amstrad's first computer product. It looks very much like a computer is very clear that was part of the design specification. It looks so much like a computery computer. It looks very much like a computer. <laughs> Coloured keys, <laughs> good dark, plastic. It, the, the design language, if that's a phrase that doesn't send people squirming, it, it's, they must have said, make this look as computery as you can make this computer. So I, I always laugh at the little diagram above the cassette tape deck. Yeah. You know? The little little electronics diagram. It's like there's no need for that to be there whatsoever. But you yeah. know, it works. It makes it yeah. look more computery for you, me, and Duncan, uh, collectively <laughs> known as the Long Boys. For our CPC <laughs> love, <laughs> Long Boys. Um, it was competitively priced. I've heard people incorrectly say it was for posh people, and they're wrong. Uh, it was priced at the same level as the ZX Spectrum. Once you included the cost of the TV. And the CPC came with a green or a colour monitor. So if you included the cost of a black and white TV or a colour TV, it worked out the same as a Spectrum. Serious question. Could anyone have accused you of being posh growing up? No. No? Well, maybe because I liked being inside. That was posh. Was that rather posh? Than, rather than, rather than outside getting dirty. Getting in <laughs> Fair enough. Um, um, likewise, you know, no one would have said I was a poor boy. No one would have said I was a, a, yeah. in a posh family. And, you know, that that that's exactly what the Amstrad CPC was pitched at, wasn't it? I think if your parents wanted to get you a computer for Christmas, they got you an Amstrad CPC if you didn't have a television. And if you already had a TV, you got a Spectrum. What if you were posh? Was that the BBC Micro? BBC Micro. Yeah. Yeah, BBC yeah. Micro. If you're one of those, you're posh. It's no surprise, though, that they got the pricing just right because 
The founder of Amstrad, Lord Alan Sugar, is renowned for not just delivering value, but also for the famous Mugs Eiffel, which is him designing a product that appears to the general public to have great value and look like a really competent product beyond what it needs to look like to do the function, which applies to the hi-fis, certainly. Um, I never had one of the hi-fis, but I think the universal experience is that they're okay for the price, but not really as good as you would want them to be. Um, the computer products that Amstrad made were a better level like this. The um, the hi fis though, were okay, I think. They were that... Uh, sorry, I just unmute myself there, Dave. They were that um, classic single-molded plastic fascia designed to look like hi-fi separates because that was the the desirable lust worthy yeah. item at the time wasn't it to have yes. hi-fi separates hi-fi separates yeah you didn't need to have the separates though because you would go and say i want i want to get hi-fi separates and i want a tuner a tape deck a record player so you would buy all the separates so he was he was in a point yeah i think part of that was you were buying into a well i can always just swap the tape player when a better one comes yeah. out that was the idea of separates whereas you know in reality you may never have ever done that with that whole system and alan sugar knew that yeah it's not just a wide range of well-priced computers that amstrad made they made vcrs camcorders fax machines and the famously failed emailer Eventually, before moving on to satellite TV set-top boxes, which they are, I don't think people are that familiar with those because they're just they're not an exciting device. Um, but they also made, and I've only just learned this, cigarette lighters, face care systems, body skates, and Sudoku players. Hmm. Now, I expect many of you will now have guessed why I've just learned about this, and it's because the Amstrad Online Museum website has finally appeared. There's quite a lot on it, but it doesn't go into a great deal of detail in each item, which is still fine, though, and I hope in the future it does. And it does, of course, paint Lord Sugar in a very positive light, um, a very much a hero of the people bringing you electronics at a good price, um, which is no surprise given how much of a, a self-promoter he is. And, of course, he's behind the project, so he is going to make himself look good. Um, but I've been always broadly positive about his products, and not just because I had a CPC, but I appreciate that, for the most part, they were well-rounded products at a fair price without any corners cut that shouldn't have been cut. That is until the emailer, which was just a bad product and it was cynical in the, in the way it was priced. Um, ultimately, they were bought by Sky in 2007, and that was rather us down to their success rather than anything else, as it it turned out that their biggest seller was set type set type bo set top boxes for satellite TVs rather than anything else they did. After he sold in 2009, he joined the ranks of the Lords Temporal as a life peer in the British House of Lords, our second chamber um, of Parliament. And even before Amstrad was sold, he'd been on the British version of the US TV show, The Apprentice, and he's been on it ever since. You're fired, is his catchphrase <laughs> there, Neil. You're fired. Like you and the viewers said last week when I wasn't on there, Dave, you're fired. <laughs> um, Neil, what do you think of the new site? And are you a sugar apologist like me, or do you think he's a bit Del Boy Trotter? Oh, he can be both, can't he? He can be yeah, a bit he of both. He is. Uh, he can be a little bit woo and a little bit wah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, um, he's got that same kind of rags to riches market trader story that the likes of Richard Branson have. And uh, he carries off that persona even today. You know, even in the House of Lords, he carries off yes. that, that bar borough boy sort of persona, doesn't he? Um, yeah. Even though he must live a life of caviar and Rolls Royces these days, oh, yeah. no doubt about it. But he made his money through Amstrad to B Sky B for £125 million in 2007. So like you say, it wasn't a failing company being snapped up. It was a company with a successful product that Sky wanted, maybe even needed, and Sugar chose to cash in at probably the right time if he's taking yeah. you know that much money away so yeah. very shrewd um in 2021 22 apparently he sold five properties for a combined income of 102 million from that he also sold his stake in football club tottenham hotspur for two uh, for for 25 million in 2007 and his net worth is now estimated at 1.074 
billion pounds. That's more than I've got in the bank. He's done all right. He's done all right. So I think it's fair to say that while Amstrad had its highs and lows, Amstrad computers did play a part in that success. It would be wrong to ever dismiss Amstrad computers as a failed or less successful part of the company than others or than other companies. Um, Commodore, for example, Sugar found a way for his company to thrive beyond his microcomputers and his hi-fis. You know, he adapted and he changed uh, while Commodore was burning down. Exactly when Commodore was burning down, Amstrad were kind of transitioning away because they had they had a bit of a disaster with a, a personal computer and um, not hard drive reliability, but I think there was some there was some sort of esp- uh, some some sabotage, wasn't there? Some nasty marketing aimed at Amstrad to say that they were less reliable than they were. Yeah, and they needed a fan and all the rest of it. But I, I think with 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 the the PCs, we haven't mentioned the PCs. We should mm. mention the PCs. He brought out a line of PCs that were priced incredibly competitively, way lower than what the alternative was. So much so that IBM PCs are quite rare in the UK, even though they were made not far from here in Greenock. Um, You bought Amstrad. You bought Amstrad because it was really cheap. But as time moved on and the rest of the market caught up in Amstrad, he left the business because the margin wasn't there. He was sharp enough to say, let's get out of this. Unlike places like Commodore and Atari, who only had one string to the bow and there's no choice but to go down with the the margins yeah let's flog the commodore 64 over and over and over again although you know amstrad did come up with the gx 4000 so they you know they they took their chances but they uh they had enough strings to the bow to to move on as well uh without going down in flames anyway on to the amstrad museum amstrad.com sugar has been talking about doing this for some time actually on social media and at first i wasn't sure if it was going to be a physical or a virtual museum what we've got is I think a pretty basic website with his products categorized, many of them um, using an op- <laughs> they used as an opportunity to flog his autobiography. W- would you be disappointed if you hadn't done that? I think though? I would. I think that's classic <laughs> sugar, isn't it? Buy my book. Uh, photos are mostly lifted from Wikipedia, but, you know, legally so through Creative Commons yeah. licenses and whatnot. Um, few of the products have information against them. Some of them you can click on and find out more. Some of them have links that says, for further reading, click here, and it just takes you to Wikipedia. Many of them are just photos for now, but I'm sure it will be fleshed out in time. I would describe it as a showcase of Alan Sugar, like you've said. It's got a kind of retro feel to the whole website, to be honest. It feels like a website someone might have knocked up 20 years ago. Uh, Not necessarily a criticism because it's functional. It works. It's not cluttered. I kind of like its simplicity. Yes. You know, it's okay. To call it a museum, bit of a stretch, do you think? Yeah. I mean, there are some links appearing on there to a YouTube channel owned by by Law Sugar, where there's a few adverts appearing. So it looks as if he's trying to source. I say he's trying to source. I'm sure right now he's sitting in his office with a mouse in his hand looking for this online. No, someone working for him is trying to source adverts of Amstrad stuff. So I think I think it will expand and become, uh, become more so. But yeah, it, it's nice and simple and clean. Yeah, it works. Um, I would love for him to create a physical museum that I could go and visit, to be honest. I'd hop on the train to London into one of his buildings and just, even if it's just sort of, you know, a small museum with all his kit laid out, I'd I'd be happy to go and see that. Um, But uh, I'm talking directly to you right now, Alan Sugar. If you do want to fund the Amstrad floor at the mill here, uh, I will make you a beautifully curated history of your products in the style of electronics retail stores traveling through time, you know, all the period correct uh, furniture with all of your products and, and decor around it. So No one would do it. I genuinely mean no one would do it better. <laughs> Call me Alan. Tell me I'm hired. Um, some favorite <laughs> some favorite items. Uh, I'm going to pick two from the website, the DD9900 and the DD9904. DD double deck video recorder, twin tape VHS, tape to tape. Double deck sounds so good. Then. Double deck. And the CDTV 50, which is not what you think it is. It's not a Commodore CDTV. It's a combined stereo CD player with a radio and a TV in it. It's like a little boom box with a TV screen built in. Amstrad means so much to me. When I think back to my Amstrad CPC, it was such a, a well-designed machine that did a lot more than what the the competition was doing for the price. But um, 
you can go and visit his website. You can have a quick look around it. It won't take you too long, and you can see some interesting stuff there in a clean layout that is um, pleasant to use. So thank you for creating that, Lord Sugar. And uh, if you'd like to come on the show as a guest, then just uh, hit me up and I'll get you on. We are sponsored, thank you very much, by Pixel Addict Magazine. Uh, Pixel Addict Magazine is an, a magazine that comes out how often? Do they come out, Neil? On the second Wednesday of every Tuesday. Yeah. The current issue of it is a Microprose special. We love Microprose, Neil, don't we? Oh, we do. I, I love Microprose, yes. And I like the cover of it. It's a, it, it, it's a... Um, it's got lots of different elements from Microprose games on it. It's got um, a, a jet fighter. It's got um, uh, pyramids, a ship, a, a racing car, and a helicopter on it. Um, there are lots in this particular one. Uh, the cover story is about Microprose, as we mentioned before a couple of weeks ago. Um, there's stuff about um, why loading from cassette tape feels better. Who do you think might have written that? Oh, I wonder. I wonder. Yeah, it? yeah I hope he had his Rue shoes on his Amstrad at the time. But it's not the only thing they've got on at the moment. They have, they've still got the Amstrad Addict Collector's Edition, so you can get that one they came out with last year. Yeah, I was just looking at that. So Amstrad Addict is a, is a special edition you can get from uh, pixel.addict.media. And um, slap bang in the middle of that, how Alan Sugar spiced up the PC market, and it talks yeah. all about just what we've been talking about on the show. Yeah. But the new thing that they haven't, I don't think they've officially tried to, to, to launch it yet, it's there available to do, is the Atari Addict. We're all Atari fans here. So Atari Addict Collector's Edition, print edition, available now. Um, go and buy it. Go and buy it. Uh, what's the website, Neil? Pixel.addict.media. Thank you for sponsoring us. A common thread through the life of this podcast and our gaming lives, if we're all honest, uh, is piracy, copyright and access to the games that we love that haven't been produced for 20, 30, 40 years or more. Dustin Bailey over at Games Radar reports that a three-year fight to help support game preservation has come to a sad end today. The U.S. Copyright Office has denied a request for a DMCA exemption that would allow libraries to remotely share digital access to preserved video games. This, of course, is a U.S.-centric story, but the precedent for the rest of us can be set anywhere in the world, and this was one such opportunity. The Video Games History Foundation has been pushing a petition to enable libraries and archives to remotely share digital access to out-of-print video games. So essentially what Archive.org does, but... Um, well, how does archive.org get away with it? Um, it's reported that 87% of all video games released in the US before 2010 are now out of print. And um, I imagine that would be a, a similar statistic in, in most regions. And that leaves us with only two ways of accessing them. Paying often large amounts of money for them on auction sites or setting sail on the digital seas, searching the dark web, um, hacking into the early hours to prize a rare ROM from behind Nintendo's firewalls. Yeah. You know, or, or, you know, just going to archive.org and downloading an entire ROM set on your lunch break. The US Copyright Office have said that the, uh, well, they've said no, basically, a big fat no. And the ruling states there would be a significant risk that preserved video games would be used for recreational purposes because nobody uses books for recreational purposes, right? And I think that's going to be perhaps the key to pushing back on this, is how can a central point of your argument be that digital lending can only be for non-recreational purposes when digital lending for recreation already exists, right? There are ways of digitally lending books, and people do it for recreation. We're not all research students with every book that we borrow, <laughs> Uh, but it's not totally black and white, of course. Archive.org was found to have violated copyright law back in 2020 when four major book publishers accused them of copyright infringement, Dave. They, they, sadly, they recently lost the appeal to that in September. Right. So that's the final nail in that, I think, is they're losing the appeal to it. And it's difficult. I think they, they were lending out more than what they had permission to for books. Mm -hmm. And it was during the pandemic when people had no other access to them. So... To libraries because libraries were shut so it's it's very easy to feel sympathetic towards mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. 
the concept of controlled digital lending or CDL, it, it's not fully mature with books. As a result of the ruling, Archive.org removed 500,000 books from its open library. And as, as you've said, things have progressed further. When we consider music, though, while some of us enjoy the ceremony of vinyl or are nostalgic about our CD collections, which we started in our teens and perhaps put away and then dusted off again from our parents' loft, um, that industry does have digital lending or, or streaming all figured out. We could have a conversation about how poorly artists are rewarded, of course. Uh, but me opening Spotify and listening to a tune is not piracy. Legal routes have been achieved and it is possible. That comes from a place of music industry moguls bullying the little guy into doing what they want and then internet moguls disrupting them while technology in the form of MP3s and broadband made rampant piracy possible. And it took time. It did take time, but it all came together. Does video game preservation need the same level of disruption to make this happen? Could anyone actually disrupt Nintendo or the Segas of this world to that level to, to make this possible? Um, it seems like it's coming from a very different place to the music industry uh, and indeed the, the publishing, the book publishing industry. Um, Dave, thoughts? I want to say that both Neil and I will be approaching this with open minds and uh, trying to present a balanced view. I think both of us are very much in favour of preservation. We want Archive Org to be there. We understand the importance of it. I am... Um, I think it's one of the, the wonders of the modern world, the Wayback Machine. Um, I think if you look at what we have, Wikipedia and archive.org are incredibly important. However, I've noticed when I've been downloading ROMs, for example, my little um, RGB30, when I'm downloading ROMs, where does it go? It goes to the Internet Archive. It's become the default place for ROM distribution. It used to be... I don't know when it started, but if you look back 20 years, you would go to piracy sites that were, would go up, ROM sites then, let's not, not, not call them piracy sites, I'm not too comfortable with calling them that, ROM sites, they would disappear, they would get shut down, but you would be able to get them somewhere, and that's all gone now. When I update my mister using update all, it gets the arcade ROMs from archive.org. If you go on archive.org, you'll find curated ROM sets for particular emulation devices. Now, a curated ROM set for a particular emulated device is not directly software preservation. That's someone producing something just so you can use it on there. And it's I, I can understand I, I can understand why that's dangerous for archive.org to do these things and be so I say brazen, it's not them doing it, but to have it so brazenly on the site because it opens them up to Nintendo and Sega, uh, Nintendo in particular, so lit lit litigious, saying this is being done for piracy, not for preservation this for the good of preserving this for the good of humanity. Yeah, if we're talking about um, renting something out to look at, right, like a library book, the, when is there ever a legitimate case when you would go in and say, oh, yeah, I just need to check out all 2,500 games that ever came out on System XYZ, please, all at once, you know? I, know? I just need every single library book in the history section, please. My truck's outside, load it up, let's go. That, that, there's, no, there's no legitimate reason for that. However, preservation is vitally important, and these things are, dis without efforts of places like the Internet Archive, they would disappear. These, these games would cease to exist. And as you said, the vast majority of them are not being sold. You cannot buy them legitimately. And even the ones you can, it's restricted in how you can and where you can play them. So there is a, there's an incredibly important purpose for this place to have. And I would rather that they did something like World of Spectrum, where the games are there, they have them, they have all the information, but you're not able to directly download them. And that would be a bit better than... Um, the worry that I have, which is they end up being so open that they lose the court cases that they need to win. There are plenty of examples on archive.org where you can find a game and you can play it within your web browser in an emulator. So, you, yeah. you know, there are still links to download the ROMs, but it's perfectly possible to make it only playable in the web browser. Now, this all being said, from a legal point of view, you and I have devices, we have misters. Um, 
let's be honest, it's convenient to be able to download a whole ROM set or even not just a ROM set, like multiple ROM sets in one download. It's convenient to use update all and it pull down all of the arcades. So that's there's a balance, isn't there? There's a balance to be found. Yeah. I, I, the, for these old games that no one's selling and no one has any commercial interest in other than just saying we might at some point in the future, come on, be reasonable about it. At the same time, though, there are people making massive amounts of money with Switch piracy, and I'm happy to use the word Switch piracy. We've covered that in the past with emulators of Switch games and ROMs available and directly being able to download and play games as they are launched on that. And that seems to get lumped in together now with software preservation in the same kind of thing, in the same kind of species, and and it's, uh, it's not. Mm-hmm. So it's it's difficult, and I don't think I have any any sound conclusions here. Anything to really yeah. say other than I want the archive org to still be there. I want it to to survive, and I think it's too important to um, for it to to fight losing battles, and it needs to fight battles it can win. Well, archive.org is the perfect platform on which to host all of this. Um, so if they could find a way of working with companies or companies could find a way of working with archive.org and just saying let's go into the nintendo section Mm. uh, and finding a way of doing it i would happily pay a subscription i i mean if if we're going to talk about the companies now which we should do Mm. libraries wouldn't exist if book book publishers had their way book publishers don't want libraries to exist it costs them money a library book that's that's read by 50 people is 50 copies of the book that might have been bought. So if it's up to Nintendo to decide if, if our, to, to decide what happens with archive.org, archive.org won't be there. Um, but it, so it does come down to governments to legislate, to decide what can we do to court, to courts to find how we can apply existing laws to new things to find out a right way to do it. Uh, I hope that they find some way to do it where Nintendo are not able to shut it down. Because if, if the companies get their way, we'd have nothing. Hmm. either way i think it's fair to say there will always be piracy dave there will always be people that want that the convenience of the complete rom set if it's not on archive.org it will move to pirate bay or wherever else that it is yeah people will yeah. find a way but it would be nice to have a safe legal legitimate outlet um through which uh, we know that if we're submitting stuff it is going to be archived there forever i've got next to me this i've got next to me this folder of Mortal Kombat design notes, which I've scanned from Richard Costello Mm. when he was doing the Mortal Kombat port for the Amiga, um, all handwritten. Um, There may be some kind of restrictions on me sharing that because it may technically belong to Probe software or Mm. whoever bought Probe. Um, So I want to know that if I submit something like that, A, I won't get into trouble, uh, and B, it will be shared in there forever they you know the site that hosts it won't get into trouble and you just can't say that with archive.org can you yeah and the, the use of the word piracy for old rom sets for the sega mega drive for example it just doesn't feel the same as, as nintendo switch stuff now piracy the piracy normal stuff now that's available to buy on the switch it's current is not the same as games that were released 30 years ago it's just not the same well uh, we're not going to find a conclusion today uh, dave but uh, thanks to good punk 2 for submitting this story won't be the last time that we discuss it we should absolutely encourage all forms of digital preservation and archiving of our games magazines associated media well while we still can while these things still exist get them preserved and then hopefully when the path is clear legally we can we can all share that and we can enjoy a, a library of video game history. Hopefully one day we will get to that point. Uh, but the news today is, <laughs> to remind myself, because we've talked about so much, the news today is that the three-year fight to support game preservation uh, got a big no from the US Copyright Office. And um, boo. boo, boo. And the Video Games History Foundation will continue fighting that good fight. <laughs> something wonderful has happened neil 
Thanks to a delay in his flight back from Terrible Bites, Ollie, as in Banjo Guy Ollie, had the idea to make an Amiga disc-based demo. He's put it out as an ADF file, which is a, an Amiga disc file, and he has said he intends to put it on GitHub. In fact, he has put it on GitHub already, so that people can always get the latest version. Um, Duncan hopefully can insert a little clip of it now. It's it's like a crack show to a game. It's a little demo, um, and it's got your coupon on it. It's got my coupon on it. And the tune, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm delighted he's done it. It's amazing. So Twer now has its own demo disc. You can download it, you can put it on disc, and you stick it in your own Amiga, like I've done. Thank you, Ollie. Links to Ollie's channels are in the show notes. I met him for the first time last weekend in person, and he's just as nice and just as charming and clever as I thought he'd be. Um, every second Monday of every Thursday, as Ollie says. <laughs> Chad of Jake and Pepe on the V4 says, watching us in a video wall, he's just finished setting up a mini CRT video wall. And this is one of his first tests set up at his drawing desk, which was us, watching us. Lots of different versions of us on the CRT video wall. Wow, you, Quite say, impressed with that. you say us, Dave. He's he's not put you on there. It's, it's me and Chris. <laughs> it's me and Chris. <laughs> so this is Cartoon Monkey Studio is the user on YouTube. Uh, so I've just subscribed to that. But yeah, you're not seeing your face on there, Dave. He's a man of taste. Also, our youngest fan, <laughs> 11 months old. Yeah, again, watching, watching not, not just not watching you, us. Not you, though. Just watching no. me and Chris, not you. Yeah. <laughs> not just watching. Let's see us. Um, clearly, she she didn't become a fan that quickly she must have seen me trying to go closer to the screen to see more of us 11 months old is this our youngest fan could be Can have a younger fan to prove it <laughs> um thank you for that 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 both of those made my day um <laughs> on to briefs now though from 42 nobody 42 Worms, or if you're in Scotland, Worms creator <laughs> shows off a red dwarf level which is filled with Easter eggs at time extension. Yeah, this is Andy Davidson, which we spoke about last week with his uh, director's cut 1.5 of Worms and all the new levels that are being submitted for release in January. So this was a really cool one. Yeah. Desperate Rip 3286 tells us that I wonder who this could be, that the Dev Den has posted its first video on YouTube. That couldn't possibly be Jason of the Dev Den posting his own links, could it? Shocking. <laughs> it is, of course, the full interview that, uh, that Jason conducts with Richard Costello. Um, considering this is his new YouTube channel and the first video, he's managed to get 2,000 views on it. Uh, and he's got just over a thousand um, subscribers. So well done, Jason. Go and check it out. It's called Dev, the number two Dev, Dev to Dev, episode one, Richard Costello. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, he picked a good guest, though. Um, so Richard, Richard quite happily talking away about his experiences in the games industry where he left it to become a driving instructor for motorsports, I think. That's right, yeah. Don't spoil the stories, but he's got some good ones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Local links us to a gardening article uh, with a headline stating the time when technical specifications used to matter to gamers is now over. And the article talks about how we used to argue about which console or platform was more powerful based on the technical abilities, but it's less important now. And I guess that, that, that comes to which platform has the best social features and which has the best exclusive games and so on. It's a fair point. It's a reasonably interesting article to read. I do remember not even looking cross-platform, just being a PC owner and having to check those specs on the side of the box before you bought yeah, a game in the yeah, shops. Yeah, you know? yeah. Oh, I really want to play this game, but I don't have a DX266. That, that'll chug on my SX33. I'll have to wait to play that. Yeah. Oh, tough times. Where are we now? It's Tomorrow Now tells us that Rose Tinted Spectrum's extremely well-received series on Games Master has released Series 2 on YouTube, so go and check out Rose Tinted Spectrum. The link to that and everything else we discuss will be in the show notes. Christ of Why Do You links us to Modern Vintage Gamers video retrospective on Wing Commander. Fantastically important game. I was surprised by how many ports it got. 
I thought it was a PC game and an Amiga game, but it went in a few, quite a few different places. Oh no, Super Wing Commander on the 3DO. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which uh, yeah, uh, Wing Commander is great, fantastic. Down with the Kolrathi. Doctor Local tells us that Alien Romulus is getting a VHS release, a proper official one. The Register article had a poll on it asking if people would buy the VHS release. The top answer is O. Oh, FFS, the vinyl fetishists are going to love this. <laughs> Beating uh, another comment, no, I'm glad VHS died and never want to see it again into second place. Um, where are they even getting these VHS tapes from? Do they? I don't know. Do, do you think it's pan and scan, so it'll be, it'll be 4 3. Do you think, though, that people are buying this not to watch it? They're buying it as an object to look at in their hand? I put a little picture on there. Hopefully, Duncan can stick it in. Um, obviously it says limited edition on it but it looks like a video video VHS from 1986 it, it's got that, that look about it, it looks great Right, if you took that video box it's like a double VHS size box yes. it's a chunky box with some yep. classic alien um, cover art on there and, and Ripley the silhouette of Ripley with, a, with the gun in the middle um, if you took that and you made it so that it was just a case that then opened up like a clamshell and had a Blu-ray or a hard drive in it with the movie and all the extras, people would snap that up and it would probably be a bit more useful, to be honest. I like that a new AVHS release exists, but I think you're right. A lot of people just want to put that on their shelves. So maybe make it... They're not wrong. I mean, if that's what we want to do, that that's fine. It's great to hold a VHS tape. There's something different about holding a VHS tape. And I've seen there's a, there's a thing now when, where people make fake vhs covers for modern releases and they look mm. really quite different to the dvd i say dvd that's how i am the blu-ray release um of them the vhs things they, they do look as if they're back in the day and there's something about them something about the design of them that that, that, that is is very nostalgic kids these days don't know what they're missing out on not being able to ride your bike to the video shop and ask if the latest movie posters are available from behind the counter for i free. used to love going to oh. azad video and browsing through what in my head is a warehouse full of videos yeah. that wasn't, of course and it, there was something about that compared to scrolling on netflix or whatever yeah manor yeah. park video store for me and i'd ride back with <laughs> rolled up movie posters under my arm we used to go to there and we used to get a, a DiMaggio's pizza. My brother and my me would get a DiMaggio's pizza and one of us would remember to say before the other, you cut, I choose. Because some one of us had to cut the pizza in half and the other person got, the other one of us got to choose which half we got. Oh. So you had to make sure it was exactly half or you'd lose out. Nice. DiMaggio's is gone, as had video is gone. Man apart video store is gone. <laughs> Give us my Romulus VHS. <laughs> oh no, I'll be on I'll be on eBay buying VG, VHS players and then trying to fix them. No, let's not do that. News just in Manor Park video stores is closed. <laughs> um there are loads more stories on the subreddit. Go knock yourself out browsing through them. If you've got a quiet, quiet 15 minutes at work, that's a good way to kill some time. Find something interesting to read. Submit your stories to us as well. Neil, you make complicated, yes, time-consuming videos which take you around a week of work for each one to produce and also involve other people contributing to it as well. How do you feel when someone makes a simpler video that gets more views than yours does? Oh, you're trying to you're trying to poke me here, aren't you? Each to their own, Dave, each to their own. Because high views don't always translate to repeat viewers or subscribers. It really depends on the type of video. Yeah. So you're saying the video is less worthy than yours? I'm not saying anyone's videos are less worthy than mine. I'm just saying, you know, a, a TikTok video that gets a million views isn't necessarily going to get a million repeat return customers, is it? Fair and enough. Subscribers. It's quality over quantity. I'm trying to set a trap for you. You are. This video we're going to talk about today is a good video. It's a simple video, but it's really well done and it deserves to be watched without criticism about the efforts going into it. It's a fantastic video. And it was submitted to the subreddit by someone called 005 Agima. Oh, who's that? Who's that? Thank you, Chris. Hello, Chris. Um, and it's what we're going to talk about today. 
1984, David Braben and Ian Bell released Elite to the BBC Micro, an amazing game we've recently spoken about as it's just had its 40th anniversary. It was a phenomenal success and it ended up on almost every platform. It took nine years for a sequel to come out. That's not too long in today's terms, but back then it was a lifetime. I played Elite long before I was a teenager, and I was nearly out of my teens when Frontier Elite 2 came out. It's now been 13 years since Skyrim came out. It's been 11 years since Grand Theft Auto 5 came out. And those games are still current and popular, with Skyrim being released, I think, 84 times now. Um, and <laughs> GTA still popular online. Those games, I think, were had the level of popularity that Elite had in the, the 80s. Um, but Elite faded away long before Elite 2 came out, mostly. Um, so it does happen now that games take a while to get their sequel, but I argue that nine years felt longer if you were young. Um, I mean, these days as well, it, the, the same platform might still be current nine years later yeah. with some of these you know, consoles, the, the way they yeah. stick around. Eventually, Frontier did come out. Ian Bell was not involved. It was designed by David Braben alone this time, although he brought in Chris Sawyer, who would later go on to make Transport Tycoon. Uh, but it wasn't Sawyer's first connection to Elite, as he'd worked on Elite Plus, which was the enhanced 16-bit version of the original, nor was it his first connection to David Braben, as he'd done the conversion of Zarch from the Archimedes to the PC, which is known as Virus on many platforms, including the PC. Frontier on the Amiga was written in machine code and takes only 400 kilobytes of disk space. Way more than 10 times more than the original BBC. I'm sure it came on two disks. No, nope, single disk. Single disk, was it? That's single disk. Crazy, isn't it? Incredible achievement, given how much more complex it is than the original. Uh, Frontier expands on the original Elite. Instead of 256 systems in eight galaxies, Frontier has, I think, 200 billion stars, most of them procedurally generated. It, of course, only has one galaxy. And instead of each system being just a single planet and a single space station with a single sun, they're a system with more than one star. There's many, many planets and moons in each system. And I think there's 30,000 inhabited planets that you can visit. And sorry if my quick Googling got the wrong figures, but I hope it gives you the scale of the thing. And it's astronomically accurate to some degree. Our local part of the Milky Way is accurate. There's some stars that you might see in the, the night sky that are enormous distances away, like Polaris. Um, it has a section with a few of the original elite locations, like Lave and Zeons in it. And you're not just restricted to Cobra Mark III. There's a plethora of ships and mods to get. And I promise I'm getting to today's submission. I just like talking about Elite. Elite 2 Frontier, not Elite 2, the one we talked about a few weeks ago, which never came out. Elite 2 is, is many different things to many people. For me, it was the sequel to the game that made me need to have a computer. I needed to have a computer when I saw Elite. I had to have it. It's a fantastic simulation of a space combat trading world where you can become your persona in the in the, the far future and you can do what you like for others it's an astrological simulation a space simulation and for others still it's an amiga benchmark of how good your new terrible fire is just to play the intro but part of the design of the open world game is that you can be what you want to be in it a pirate a trader a bounty hunter you can run missions transporting people around in cabins you can do missions for the Empire or the Navy. You can trade in drugs. You can, I have to say, it's a bit thin, though, in terms of things become repetitive. And I also feel that Frontier First Encounters is a sort of an upgrade to it, and it's a better game. It feels like the same engine with more added, and I think it is, in the same way that Elite Plus or Archimedes Elite is to the original. I'd recommend, if you want to play and you haven't played, I'd recommend Frontier First Encounters. But the point of today's submission is that what it means to one man who's made a video on it, it's a space simulator for him. His video shows gameplay with captains explaining the numbers, the physics, and how realistic it is. It's a fantastic way to see the game in ways that perhaps you don't know or appreciate just how accurate they try to be with the laws of physics. 
It's clear the author is an astronomy fan. And in fact, the game's creator is to game, the game creator David Braben is an astronomer as well. Uh, the Mystic Mushroom, and that's the channel that made the video, he calls Frontier the second best space simulator ever. And he doesn't just mean that first encounters or dangerous is better. He's talking about in terms of simulating space that you can in some way experience it. And that's important about Frontier. And I think something I'd forgotten about over the years, you do start out in our solar system. The nearest star system is Alpha Centauri. And next to that is Barnard Star. And looking on Wikipedia down a list of our neighbors, our nearest neighbors, um, they're all in the game. Um, it wasn't officially made as a simulation of space, not overtly marketed as this is a simulation of accurate space, but it's very clear David Raven had that in mind. Neil, what do you think? Well, I think... Sorry, I've, I've gone on for so long without letting you speak okay. at all. I think I've left it just long enough for people to have left their comments and said, you're wrong, Dave, it came on two discs. But we are both technically right, because yes, it did come on two discs, but uh, I found it over on Lemon Amiga, a user called Life School has posted on the forum that Disc 2 contains a few scenarios that you can load up to jump into the actions, but most players, I guess, never bother to try them more than once. David Brabham himself went on record some years later to say that the second disc was redundant and they really shouldn't have bothered to include it. It was meant to be used as the player's game save disc. Most players I know formatted a separate disc to save their games for and ignored the second disc. So yes, it did all fit on one disc. Yes, you are right, but it did come with two discs. I guess they didn't want to put the save disc on the same disc. Yeah. Could have fitted it on there. If it was only 400 kilobytes, could have fitted it on. But then, of course, Write Protect comes off and it gets corrupted and they have to send out disc to people. Yeah, yeah. The video itself, it's, it's a fun video from the Mystic Mushroom. Uh, it's a reminder of how awe-inspiring and vast a video game could be 30 years ago, 30 years plus. Um, the whole video is just shot from behind, like you say, for looking back in the spaceship as you take off from Earth and it just gets further and further away while these f fun bits of information appear on the screen. Personally, I remember buying Frontier Elite from WH Smith's diminishing at the time computer game section. Even then, it was starting to be slimmed down uh, in my town. I opened the box. I was giddy, Dave. I was giddy with the, the new game, Fresh Ink on Manual Smell. It was... It was a good smelling box. That star one. map. Oh, and the star map, which folded out lots of black ink on there to, to be all smelly and put on your wall. Oh, <laughs> give me a moment. Now, I ran it on my Amiga 500, which didn't have an accelerator. And yes, I got the vastness of space and the fun of it all. But even I, if I'm honest, was a bit bummed with the frame rate on the on the intro there on my stock Amiga. Um, or nearly stock Amiga, just a bit, bit of extra RAM. So this really is a game that shines with the power it deserves to play it, but many people did get plenty of enjoyment out of it on their A500s. The video is fun. It's a really nice way of enjoying the nostalgia of the game for us oldies. It's a nice way of presenting to those who aren't old enough to remember it first time round the vastness of it and that these things did exist in video games. It wasn't all Mario jumping on mushrooms and going down pipes. <laughs> um, and it's a nice way to enjoy the nostalgia of it without somebody else imposing their opinion on it or even even reviewing it. Just, just you just kind of wallow in this video, don't you? Yeah, and then yeah. It's, it's and there's it, facts I, as well. I, I like think that. to be fair, the video is a fantastic idea for a video, and that's why it works. Yeah. So it's nice. Um, and then, it, well, his, what's his, his, his next video? Did you tell us what the number one space game is? I'm going to. I'm going tell to. Tell us, Dave. Tell us. I'm going to. Before I do that, I'll say I played it on the PC and I never had the frame rate problems you had. Play it on the PC. Um, his next video goes on to explain what he thinks is best. And it's a game, and I've used inverted commas there, because it's not quite a game. It's called Space Engine. It's on Steam now, and it's an early access the blurb for the game says, Space Engine is a 1-1 one -one scale science-based universe simulator featuring billions upon billions of galaxies, nebulae, stars, and planets, all shown at their real full world, no, their full real world scale. Explore Earth and our neighboring worlds in the solar system, orbit a black hole in a galaxy billions of light years away, or visit anything in between seamlessly with no transitions. Yeah. Does that appeal to you? It's funny because if you'd asked me 
when I was 10 years old, I would have taken off from the earth and gone, wow, this is amazing. And I would have sat for hours just exploring the vastness of space and making up stories in my mind and all the rest of it. But because Elite is such a copied format and space games have evolved in the way they have, um, you kind of you just get to those bits now where you just go, yeah, just hyperspace, just jump that, jump that bit, jump that bit, let's get to the mission objective. Is that just me or do you do that, Dave? Um yeah yeah um yeah i uh i still appreciate the idea of this i would want it to be and i haven't i just haven't had a look to find out i want it to be as accurate as possible i like the idea of traveling i don't there's loads of things you could do traveling a billion light years away and looking back on the earth you wouldn't see the earth you see the milky way from a billion light years away i would like the idea of traveling to alpha centauri and seeing what it's really like there traveling to jupiter uh, and doing a flyby over there I, I i hope this can be accurate in terms that we could do real sightseeing in space like like it, uh, 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 accurate to what it is not just procedurally generated stuff that isn't real yeah i like that i appreciate this yeah, it's I like think that would appeal to space, me. The game, yeah, I like that. So, and this this video of what he says is the number one space game has a tenth of the views of what he calls the second best space game. So, Dave, <laughs> why are ten times more people interested in the second best space game than the best space game ever made? In thirty years' time, that'll be reversed because by then people who played Space Engine will go back for nostalgia and watch that video. But at the moment, it's people who played Frontier looking back at it and going, oh yeah, it was that good, it was that amazing, I did get those feelings from it. That's what it is, I think. In 30 years, it will be people on Mars making videos of Frontier flying back to Earth and going, look how realistic it is. This game's <laughs> 60 years old. Will we be living in Mars then? Oh yeah. It's so bracing. <laughs> um, I did add it to a wish list and at some point when I'm in the mood for it I think I need to be in the mood for this in the mood for it it'll come up on sale and Steam will remind me about it and I'll say I'll give that a shot um, and I'll have a look exploring space um, I think I'll go to Barnard Star first of all the two of us can we can we can multiplay together and we can yeah. boldly go Boldly go where no man has gone before. Where no baldies have gone before. We should end the show on this, Neil. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Chris can come too. <laughs> Duncan can come if he shaves his head. Time now for our community question of the week. And last week we asked the question, what vintage game developer would you like to dust off and recap their dev system? And what game would you like them to update for the original platform? Now, Dave, did we have some issues with our question of the week was everything did everything go smoothly this week it, it wasn't pinned correctly um ah. let's not blame anyone it's just one of no. these things this wasn't pinned correctly but, people but it was found still it. there people found it oh people found okay. it yeah. good 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 yeah. i was worried we wouldn't have answers okay yeah. excellent so um have you taken us out of contest mode i am frantically desperately trying to do that now neil because we couldn't so do it disable. last week. We didn't have the power, or I just couldn't find the button. You couldn't find the button. I have to go to old.reddit to do it to find it. But we are now out of contest mode. There are lots of loads of answers this week. The top answer has lots of lots and lots and lots of upvotes. So the person who said it has said something that hit a chord with everyone. Yep. So that's Richard Shears, regular listener. Hello, Richard. He says, uh, Hang on. What's the question? I read the question. Did you? Yeah, pay attention, Dave. Yes. So I was too busy looking for contest mode. Well, just for you, Dave, it was what vintage game developer would you like to dust off and recap their dev system? What game would you like them to update for the original platform? Richard Shears says, uh, as I glance to my left and see the blue box shouting his name, Jeff Crammond. Yes, I yes. still love Stunt Car Racer. The Sentinel was truly original and captivated me on my CPC. Yes. And I doubt anyone enjoying the 16-bit micro era can forget the Grand Prix series, or just for my brother, the Grand Prix series. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as he used to call it. Um, yeah, Jeff Crammond. Can't go wrong with that, can you? would love yeah. to see him. 
Uh, the Sentinel. I like that Richard's mentioned the Sentinel. People don't talk about it too much. It's a fantastic game. It's really interesting. I remember getting into it, really, really enjoying it, and then going back to visit it in the modern day and going, how the how, how do you play this? I can't remember. <laughs> it took me ages to figure out again how to play it, but it was worth the effort. Well, go on. Generation yeah. Pixel. Hello, yeah. Generation Pixel. Ultimate play the game, and I want them to redo them all, but with the caveat that they take the difficulty of Lunar Jetman down a notch or two. I would, quite, I would love it if someone snuck into every game that's ever been done for the 8-bit and 16-bit world and just load the difficulty a bit quietly without telling me. Uh, and Pajaco6502 says, and finally release, is that Mir Mare? Does he mean Mir Mare? I don't know Mir Mare. Is Mir Mare. Has, he, has he got a bit yeah. of autocorrect going on there? Hang on, let me check. No, it is a game. It is a game. I'm showing my ignorance. Mir Mare. Um Oh, yeah, it looks like... Um, it's a 2020 game by Luca Bordoni. This is an imagining of what the unreleased game by Ultimate... Okay, so it was an unreleased game by uh, Ultimate. A, f- a sort of fan-made version was reimagined and released. Um, so, uh, okay, we've got to the bottom of that, Pajaco. He'd like to he'd like to see them finish that. Um, Tested a Murder says Eric uh, Chai and Paul... Uh, Cousette, uh, for all those wonderful Delphine games. Sorry, I was sighing because I was just sighing up my own pronunciation of names there. Uh, Delphine games, wonderful. Uh, there's, th- We know the big ones, but there's quite a few lesser-known Delphine games that I've been trying to collect lately. They're not particularly expensive, um, but just because there's something about that Delphine logo that... It's it's a the clapperboard logo. Yeah, I really love it. It doesn't necessarily mean you're getting a game of quality. They made some no. great games, but they also they, made they some always stinkers. Had a decent idea. They a, they always had. It was they were trying something at least. Yeah, is it Castle Warrior? That's a Delphine one, which is absolutely awful. Um, but then they make up for it for things with things like Operation Stealth and Flashback and Cruise for a Corpse. Another one that I wanted a slightly faster Amiga to play on, but I did enjoy it. Um, lots of great games. There are lots of other suggestions here, which we can't miss out. So Calling Activist says Bullfrog. Yeah, they they did so many fantastic games. Beaten Tyrone um, says Nova Gen. Yes, please. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes, Dave. Thank you, Paul Wokes. Um Tungsten Orchard has a, has a good answer. He says, I'm going to say System 3 to revive their last Ninja games. Then I remembered that they're already doing it. Never mind. I've already signed up to the crowd yeah. planning, the crowdfunding platform. Antique campaign. for Geek says, don't laugh, but I'd like DID to return uh, and to return to Epic on the Amiga. Well, a social media account for DID has appeared recently and has been celebrating its history. I think this is just another case of the modern microprose, the modern DID. Mm. No real link back to the original company, but great if they're going to celebrate their history and start to bring out new products using their IP. Let's see it. Bring it. Starkey2084 is an interesting one. It says Infocom. Uh, I'd love to see a third game in the Planetfall series come out with some fun feelies in the box with a version for the Commodore 64. And says, which reminds me, I have the novelizations in the shelf I need to get to. But Infocom, I would like it if they did uh, an improved version of them and just added solutions and like ways to do things that the the engine stopped, that the engine wasn't aware of, better vocabulary and so on, just to make them a little bit less unforgiving but without actually changing the games that would be fantastic for infocom um they're timeless though um, uh, yeah and finally manx nick says broaderbund because of games like choplifter load runner and the amazing prince of persia and the mist and carmen san diego games lovely choices origin and the crusader series what engine did the crusader series use neil oh that was ultimate eight wasn't it fantastic now we've said ultimate today <laughs> couldn't do without it <laughs> Do we have a question for this week for people? Well, I've put one in there. Uh, I'm open to uh, other suggestions, Dave, um, based on the chats we've had today. Um, You happy with that question? Yes. Okay. So who should follow Alan Sugar's suit and create their own museum of products and why? Savile Row suit. 
No, not I don't mean suits, Dave. Example. Who should follow Alan Sugar's example and create a uh, slightly simple, albeit functional, um, website with links to their products on Wikipedia? And why? Whilst trying to sell their own autobiography. Yes. <laughs> Sugary. <laughs> Can you do his voice? No. I know you can't. No, I can't do any voices. <laughs> Rubbish with voices. We will be back next week. Thank you for being with us this week and enduring our terrible jokes. Um, it's goodbye from him. It's goodbye from me. <laughs> See you next time. He's waving. I'm waving. Neil's waving. Bye-bye, Twirlers. Oh, Dave, I didn't press record. Week in Retro was presented by Neil from RNC The Cave and Dave. It was produced by me, Duncan Styles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favourite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r stroke this week in retro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you enjoy our show and would like to support it, then please check out the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or description. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.